Putting an end to a hybrid war is a very difficult task. The truth is that the mass media turns into a weapon of mass destruction. By skillfully manipulating facts and words, the aggressor attempts to sow fear and panic in an attempt to break the will of the enemy to resist. But a dog gets used to its fleas. And if a war does not end within the first five days of action, then such fear turns into hatred. You are watching the 57th episode of the program about the ATO – History of the War. In 2014, the Russian Federation committed an act of armed aggression against Ukraine. The war has been ongoing for several years. We're hot on the trail of the events and are tracing the links between military operations, diplomacy, politics and economics. We're trying to understand how it evolved and for what purpose. It's easy to start a war, but it's very hard to end it. It is even harder to end the war if the aggressor country does not desire peace. The Russian Federation publicly declared its peaceful intentions and the defense of the rights of the so-called people of the Donbass. Be that as it may, the Russian Federation sent its troops to the east of Ukraine without publicly admitting this fact. <laughs> As soon as soldiers crossed the border, they practically became mercenaries and the Russian Federation generously provided them with all weaponry that was possible. On June 14, Russian-backed militants began more intense fighting in the north of the ATO zone. As a result of mortar shelling, a school, a village council building and several residential buildings were destroyed in the rural town of Novotoshkivka. As a result of a heavy artillery attack during the night, a five-story residential building was severely damaged in Trokhizbenka and two private homes were completely destroyed in the village of Zolote. On the same day, the Russian-backed militants fired at a repair brigade that fixed the water supply system between the town of Popasna and the village of Zolote. The reason for this destruction was low discipline in the camp of the Russian-backed militants, as well as a low level of weapon possession. It should be understood that the main targets of the militants were the Ukrainian military positions, but the lack of qualification of gun crews, multiplied by the usual negligence, led to serious misfires. As a result of battles and shelling, two Ukrainian soldiers were wounded during the day and another two soldiers died in hospitals due to serious injuries they sustained earlier. By the lock of the draw, on June 14, no civilians were injured. On June 15, Ukraine suffered human losses in the areas of Avdiivka and Shirokina, where two soldiers were killed as a result of heavy artillery shelling. The diverse reliefs of land are typical for different areas of the ATO zone, which dictate different patterns of the battles. In the south, in the steppes of the Azov region, Russian-backed militants actively used armored vehicles. In the area of Donetsk, there was a mine and sniper war. In the north, dense vegetation created favorable conditions for special forces. On June 15, in the area of the village of Krakivka of Luhansk region, the enemy's reconnaissance and sabotage group attempted to penetrate the territory controlled by Ukraine. During the four-hour battle, two Ukrainian soldiers were killed and another two were injured. With the reinforcements that arrived in time, Ukrainian forces succeeded in repelling the militants' attack. As a result, three Russian-backed militants were killed. In response to the actions of the enemy on June 17, as a result of special operations, the Ukrainian troops managed to neutralize the Russian enemy sniper group. Understand that the term neutralization should be interpreted as the infliction of human losses to the soldiers of the enemy forces. However, we should not forget about local militants who bombarded the entire front line with mortar bombs and shells, disguising the actions of Russian special groups. On June 17, as a result of the fire attack on the Ukrainian positions in the area of the settlement of Zolote, three soldiers were injured and one was killed.
On the same day, in the area of the village of Piski, one Ukrainian volunteer was killed by a sniper bullet. On the night of June 18th, as a result of an ambush and an explosion of the mines, the 28th Brigade lost two scouts in the area of Krasnohorivka. Moreover, in this case, the militants tried to take away the bodies of killed Ukrainian soldiers and the reserve, which arrived at the battlefield, basically had to recover the bodies. Another fighter was killed by an explosion of a mine near the village of Berknoturetske in the Yasinovata rayon. It is noteworthy that despite the agreement on the withdrawal of heavy weapons, the Russian Federation did not intend seizing the provision of the militants with military hardware and ammunition. On June 17, information appeared about the redeployment of six D-30 howitzer weapons and eight self-propelled howitzers 2S-1 Vozdika to the area of Pavlopil and Shirokina. The increase in the number of heavy artillery was also observed in the area of Debaltseve. In the vicinity of Mironevske, mobile tank groups of two to three vehicles were formed, which fired at the Ukrainian positions when darkness descended, and closer to the morning they once again retreated to their original positions. On June 18th, another 30th so-called humanitarian convoy arrived on the territory of Ukraine. According to the Ministry of Emergency Situations of Russia, around 100 trucks delivered about 1,000 tons of various humanitarian aid cargoes, but no documents confirming this fact were provided. It should be noted that the next day after the unloading of the humanitarian convoy, another escalation of the military conflict began along the entire line of demarcation. Already on June 19th, that is, the day after the arrival of the alleged humanitarian convoy from Russia, the town of Popasna was fired at with the use of the Grad missile system. One soldier of the National Guard of Ukraine was seriously injured. The length of the line of demarcation in the Donbass is 450 kilometers. Seizing fire in one area, the enemy intensified firing in another one. Almost every day, dozens of shelling and light military clashes were recorded. On 20th of June, two Ukrainian soldiers were killed in a battle with an enemy reconnaissance group in the area of Chermalik. The realities of positional warfare brought about changes in the tactics of the use of heavy weaponry, where shelling often masked the actions of snipers and the advancement of reconnaissance groups. On June 21st, in the area of Avdivka Opetna, the Ukrainian positions were fired at by a tank. As a result, the communication line was damaged. Trying to eliminate the disconnection, two soldiers of the 93rd Brigade came under sniper fire, and Sergeant Vitaly Kazak was killed right away. While attempting to evacuate his body, his colleague, junior sergeant Iher Patuk, was killed by a tank shell. In the evening of the same day, June 21st, there was a car accident in Mariupol. An ambulance that brought fighters to the hospital who were injured in the battles of Shirokina crashed into a taxi car. As a result of the accident, two people suffered. One of the taxi passengers died of injuries in the hospital. War is always a tragedy. A resident of Mariupol and soldier of the 25th Brigade, Oleksiy Vasukov, was killed. A veteran of the battles of Slavyansk, Debaltseve and the Donetsk International Airport came to his hometown on vacation to introduce his bride to his parents. On June 22nd, the Russian-backed militants fired at the Ukrainian positions 85 times and 52 cases of ceasefire violation were registered in the Donetsk direction. In the area of the airport, the fighting raged on practically around the clock. At night, hiding from OSCE observers in residential areas, the Russian-backed militants used howitzers of 152mm caliber. It is noteworthy that while waiting for the return fire, the pro-Russian mass media reported about the alleged brutal shelling of the city in advance. A similar situation was observed in the Azov region, where the battles of Shirokina continued. In the area of the village of Nizhnya, Popasna Rayon, the Russian-backed militants used the Grad multiple launch rocket system. In Marinka, a soldier of 20th battalion was killed by sniper fire. As was noted earlier, it is not necessary to crush the enemy's army. Sometimes it is simply enough to deprive it of its livelihood. Facing fierce resistance on a real front and effective opposition on the diplomatic scene, Russia changed its tactics. That was when the war of attrition started.
On June 23rd, Russian backed militants fired at Ukrainian positions 40 times. The whole arsenal of available weapons, including cannon artillery and Grad multiple rocket launchers, was used. The real effectiveness of these numerous hits was low. The enemy was unable to create the prerequisites for a front breakthrough, but a soldier of the 57th Brigade was killed in the area of Marinka. The situation with dozens of shooting attacks every day is becoming a common occurrence, with no concern about the accuracy of targeting. The militants attacked both the Ukrainian positions and the settlements. This led to the death of civilians, disruption of the work of the remnants of certain Donbass industrial enterprises and the destruction of the infrastructure. All this eventually led to enormous costs. In this situation, the Ukrainian troops had no choice but to sharpen the art of the counter-battery struggle. On June 24, in response to the use of heavy artillery systems by Russian-backed militants in the area of Popasna, four Russian soldiers were killed and another seven Russian militants were injured. However, the simple term countermeasures is the result of sophisticated and dangerous intelligence work. On June 25, during a special operation in the area of the village of Pikuzi, which was located in an uncontrolled gray zone, a reconnaissance group of the 37th Battalion was ambushed. Having accepted the battle, the scouts killed at least one militant, but they also suffered human losses. Covering his comrades, reconnaissance agent Alexander Dubovik was seriously injured and died several hours later in a hospital in Mariupol. On the same day, the next so-called 31st Putin's humanitarian convoy arrived on the territory of Ukraine. Another 100 trucks brought a new 1,000 tons of cargo. Once again, Russia announced the delivery of exclusively humanitarian cargo to the population of the Donbass. And again, the very next day, after unloading of the convoy, the militants reactivated. On June 26, Ukrainian military positions came under fire 86 times. From this number, 50 attacks were launched in the nucleus of the ATO zone, in the area of Marinka. In Shirokina, the militants set a record of sorts. Firing at the Ukrainian positions by using the self-propelled howitzers Gvozdika, they fired 99 shells within 20 minutes. Unable to respond to the shooting attacks, the Ukrainian gunners attacked the previously reconnoitered building where the Russian-backed militants were resting. As a result of several accurate hits, the militants suffered serious human losses and requested a truce. The fire was ceased, but the day of June 26 cost the lives of three Ukrainian soldiers. The summer offensive of the Russian hybrid forces in Marinka suffered a fiasco. The enemy did not fulfill the tasks, suffered serious losses and lost the offensive potential. But seeing as Russia is a large country, it's not so difficult for the former superpower to throw another brigade or division into battle. But waging war is very costly. In an effort not to defeat Russia, but to leave it without means for waging war, Ukraine held the line of defense in the Donbass steppes, but actively counterattacked at the diplomatic level. Clear documentation of the facts of aggression, in conjunction with constant attacks to establish a truce on the front, showed the whole world who was attacked and who was the aggressor. Questions: Who is guilty in the death of the local population? Who violated international law, annexed Crimea and shot down MH17 aircraft? Were left unanswered. But diplomacy is powerless if the front falls. Without the army, politics, economics, diplomacy and the mass media has absolutely no meaning. That is why the army has to hold the field.